This feels like the top of the world. And it's hard to imagine in this beautiful clean air that it's got industrial wastes and car exhausts and other pollutants in it. But it has, even if they dilute. And one of the worst of them is carbon dioxide, which is the stuff that I breathe out and you breathe out and is released when we burn coal or wood. And it's causing a bit of a problem. It's causing an effect known as the greenhouse effect. Now, if you've been in a greenhouse, you'll know what I mean. The heat comes in through the glass of the greenhouse, heats everything up underneath and can't escape back through the glass. So you get this increasing heat building up underneath the glass layer. And the carbon dioxide that's all the way around the earth is having the same effect. The heat comes in, gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and it can't escape. So even in places like this, where there are mountains of snow, things are warming up and glaciers like this are melting. This is the Tasman Glacier at Mount Cook in New Zealand. And it's been melting steadily for about 80 years. It's started to accelerate. And of course, that's a problem if the polar ice caps do the same thing, because they'll release such a lot of water that the oceans will rise and put coastal towns underwater. So it's a serious problem, or it could be. And scientists are trying to study it by working out what's happening in the atmosphere. But that's difficult. How do we know what the atmosphere was like 80 years ago when this started to melt? How do we know what it was like 200 years ago when the Europeans first got here? Well, fortunately, the glacier itself can give us some clues. Now, a glacier is a river of ice, but it's not a frozen river. It's actually made of snow. On the surface, it's nice and loose. You can ski on it. But if you get your axe into it and pick down deeper, you find it gets harder and harder and harder because the weight of the snow is compressing the whole thing down. So in there, it's really ice. Ice with a lot of air trapped in the pockets between it. So the whole thing compresses. And if you look at this, about a metre of ice represents five metres of original snowfall. Now, the glacier breaks its back on mounds in the earth beneath. So you get opening up into it crevices, and they get wider and wider. The thing splits apart, exposing cliffs of ice. And if you look at them, you can see how the glacier is formed year by year. Because in summer, when the snow doesn't fall, dust does. And that makes a little telltale dark line. And this great block slumped to its side, rather. But you can see there are one, two, three, four, probably about six lines working back to here. Those are summer. And they're just like the growth rings in a tree. Well, here there's a particularly dark line. In 1983, overseas in Australia, there were some very bad bushfires. A lot of the ash came this way. And that's the telltale line there. That allows us to date the glacier. Volcanic eruptions halfway around the Earth will leave their sign here as well. So we can actually tell how old it is and how old the air is trapped between the lumps of ice. And you can see, the deeper you go, the older it gets. And in some places, this is 500 metres thick. Well, of course, being a river, it's on the move, about 30 centimetres a day. So as you go down, it gets older. But right down at the bottom of the hill, it's very old. Let's go down and have a look at that. the foot of the glacier, close to where it ends. It's come sliding for 27 kilometres down that mountainside past this point. And because it's the foot of the mountain, it's warmer here and the ice is melting. But the speed at which it's melting is really of concern to scientists. This valley is three kilometres across, and it used to be full of glacier. A hundred years ago, I'd stepped from this rock up onto the glacier surface. Nowadays, the surface is right down there. And most of the melting's taken place in the last 30 years, probably because of the greenhouse effect. The glacier still is there, of course. It's just buried by all this rock and debris that is transported down the mountainside. And, of course, that's not all it's transported. Well, 
This is the end of it all. 27 kilometres of glacier stops right here. And it's releasing up things at a great rate. Boulders are dropping off down there. They're thundering all the way down around me. But of course, we're not interested in the boulders. We're more interested in the stuff we started with. So let me clean a bit of that ice off and knock a piece off and we'll see what it contains. Here goes. Now in this trip down the valley, this has been tremendously compressed and it's rearranged the ice crystals and also, of course, the air inside it. But there is air inside it and we can release it if we do a couple of tricks. Let's knock a little bit off. There we are. Now if we put that into water and melt it, we should be able to see the bubbles rising to the surface. So here goes. And there they go, tiny little bubbles that have been trapped in there for two or three hundred years. That might even be the air that Captain Cook was breathing when he landed here. But the important point about it is that it's got no factory wastes, no car exhausts, nothing that wasn't here two hundred years ago. So by sampling that, scientists can work out what the atmosphere was like and compare it to what the atmosphere is like now. And of course that gives us a very good guide to what we're doing with the atmosphere. That's the first step to controlling it. And of course, once we can control it, we can stop great glacial melts like this one.